A reminder, the first 30 minutes of this podcast are available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, and many of the major platforms. The full podcast is available at www.patreon.com forward slash SRB Media. SRB Media. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of The Curran View with the man himself, the idol of Hillsborough, Mr. Terry Curran. Your host is the Gabby Cabby, Paul Collins. Steady away, what kind of week you have, mate? That's it, steady away, as usual. The tenor was a bit poorly uh, last night, so I, I went up there. Yeah. Um, weather's been absolutely garbage. I've not seen frost like this for a long, long time. How bad has it been up there? I mean, it's not been too bad in Birmingham. We had a little Shocking. bit of snow. It's been really, really bad. It's not lifted yeah. at all um, for a good three days, really. So mm. there's not much you can do when it's like. Having said that, we we, we went to uh, Pontefract this morning trying to get a bit of fresh air, like you know. So how far is that from where you live, to? Ponty, six, seven mile, eight mile. Oh, okay. Do you still live in Kinsley? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I was born, and that's where I am. The King of Kingsley. What have you sourced for us in terms of magic moments, T, this week? There's been an awful lot. It's been another oh, great I... week, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we say it every week. I mean, that uh, Elliot scored an absolutely yeah, good goal, unbelievable it? goal for, for, for Liverpool last night. Should the goalkeeper got closer to it? it the problem with, with it... it, it, it Modern day football, the mm. ball swerves. Yeah, it does, yeah, it does, yeah. You yeah. know, uh, I'm not a goalkeeper. Mm. You know, you're watching it from television, you know, on, on a football field, or you're watching your own team on a regular basis, you'll know whether your goalkeeper's good enough, whether he's making your mistake, whether he's making mistakes which cost you games. That's what makes elite managers. Yeah. You know, the ball does swerve compared to, 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 to my day, and even before my day, mm. when they had the lace balls, you know what I mean? Leather balls with laces in. Absolutely. So, uh, but again, I'm going for uh, I'm going for uh, my team Volks against uh, Wickham. Brilliant goal. An unbelievable goal. But like you said, there's that many that many great goals this week. It's been un- unbelievable, hasn't it? Absolutely. And um, the fella last night at Liverpool, but uh, beating and knocking out Wolverhampton Wanderers out the FA Cup. I thought Wolves were terrible last night. But it will always be remembered, Harvey Elliott's goal as the sex noise game, won't it, <laughs> on the BBC. Lineker didn't know where to put himself, and Danny Murphy and Paul Lynch oh, just didn't know where the noises were coming from. Who oh, put, uh, oh, put that in? Uh, Apparently did some clown. Yeah, some clown, some YouTuber. <clears throat> I mean, they did talk about it on TalkSport today. Well, how could, they, how, could they, how could they get it into it? I've no idea. I was thinking about that myself today. It could have, it must have been, you know, these pranksters, the way that the the, the con men, aren't they? And they probably were telling the people at the Molyneux that they were working for the BBC, etc. Went in there and just planted this phone. And whenever it went to the live feed, this uh, these sex noises kept going off. But it gave everybody a laugh. But it, it is the new new. It's the modern age. These YouTubers, these clowns, they want to do these things for attention because they're not good enough to do things in their own right. So they have to look. It's like these these boxers, YouTube boxers. Why anybody would want to watch a YouTube boxer when you can ro- watch a real boxer fight, I don't know. But again, it's the way that the kids view things these days. Absolutely pathetic. How I viewed things on uh, the weekend, I thought that strike from the Vokes from Sheffield Wednesday was unreal. What a strike. What a goal. Some great goals this year. Oh, know. yeah. They had they, Sheffield Wednesday could have their own goal. Of, I mean, that video that they bring out at the end of the season is going to be spectacular. I mean, I remember Birmingham a few years ago. We had our uh, 20 greatest throw-in videos. But when there's going to be so many great goals from the promotion, uh, clinching and winning season. And as you've alluded to, T, going up as champions, top draw. Yeah, for me, the, for me they'll definitely go up as champions now. I think uh, got a couple of good games to get, to, you know, a good six points out of it. And then they, they take uh, take on Ipswich and Plymouth. So, you know, they are really big six pointers. So that's going to be a big, big, not only for Wednesday, but for Plymouth and for Ipswich. I think League One has got some real competitive sides. The weekend we're going to be talking about in the uh, football forecast, Derby playing Bolton. I mean, there's going to be almost 30,000 
watching that game. There's 30,000 watching Sheffield Wednesday. You know, there's some really big clubs in League yeah. One and they so really, really are all punching. Like you said, it's, a com- it's a competitive league, that Barnsley, Bolton, Ipswich, Plymouth are a decent size. You know, MK don't. I know they don't play, but if they have a bit of success, they get about 12, 15, 000. It's, it is, it's, a, it's a tough league, that. Very, very tough league. It certainly is. You know, people go on about the championship being the hardest league to get out of, but there's some tremendous teams in League One, and we're going to be doing the League One watch uh, going forward on the podcast, and uh, you know, seeing if Wednesday can get over the line, and uh, hoping that they will. Uh, Barley Mumba, I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but he scored a great goal, the equalising goal for Plymouth at Portman Road the weekend when there was pretty much a full house. And I was looking through the socials of Plymouth Argyle, at Argyle on Twitter, and they were showing some uh, great bits of skill by the said player, Bally Mumba, who I'd not heard of before I was watching this. And it was a tremendous back pass by one of the players. Now, I don't mean a back pass. I mean a pass from his back. I thought it was superb. It was almost like one of my magic moments, Martinelli's back control when we were talking on Sunday. And I said to you, are you watching this? What a bit of control. And these are the things that I look at football and look at those magic moments and um, get excited about. Yeah, well, I, did, I haven't seen it. Uh, but when you see anything like that, yeah. Ron and Dino used to do it. Hell of a lot, didn't it? Absolutely, yeah, he did, yeah. You know, so um, it, it, it's brilliant that uh, players see it, see the see the position and see where uh, it, where they can get away with it. Where they can get away with it, mean mean what they mean, do what they mean to do with it. You know what I mean? Absolutely, great, it's an entertainment. Great skills. I'm watching. I don't know. Are you watching Palace? Are you in front of your TV screen at the moment? Palace no, taking no, on Man United. I'm going to go into the bedroom in a bit to watch it. Yeah, I do like Palace. I think Vieira's doing a great job. I, I do listen to the uh, the narrative on, on radio stations and saying, well, what's he done different to what um, Roy Hodgson done at Crystal Palace? I'll tell you a bit what he's more doing. Braver. Yeah, absolutely. What he's doing is he's making me watch Crystal <laughs> Palace and enjoying watching Crystal Palace because I think they're a great watch. I think they've got some great players. Yeah, it, it, we we spoke about this, like you said, and, and I know you uh, are really fascinated by Palace. So, so am I. Yeah. I mean, Zaha, if he got more goals to, if he had had more goals to his game, still a great player. Yeah. But to make no mistake, it'd be you know, it'd be one that everybody would be chasing. Absolutely, you know? Elise is the same. Um, Eze oh. is another one. Great players, three tremendous players, comfortable on the ball, as Alan Hudson always says. They're like a five-a-side team. You know, they like to pass the ball about and they're easy on the eye. And, and I think it's a great a great place as well, Sellers Park. Have you got many memories of playing there at Crystal Palace? Was it as rowdy as that back in your day with the, the glad all over? It was it's always a fantastic um, uh, football ground to play at. Yes, I used to play that to glad all over down there when, when I played there. You know, lots of ground. I play, enjoy playing in lots of ground because there is lots of the ground stadiums. You know, uh, the atmosphere is, is absolutely sublime. So that's one of the... Anybody will tell you, and it's close to the pitch. Yeah. It's Crystal Palace. That's another good thing about that. That's the nice thing about these old grounds, unlike the modern ground where they build them. I mean... London Stadium, West Ham that have moved into that um, a Commonwealth Stadium Manchester City did move into the Commonwealth Stadium as well both really wasn't football stadiums but Man City made it a football stadium, West Ham United haven't been able to do that and the fans have always moaned about the London Stadium however last season they weren't really moaning but now they're in the bottom three they're moaning again but these stadiums I just think that you know, these smaller grounds, these tighter, more compact, like the bowling ground, Upton Park, I, I just think that they were special grounds. And I think that little bit of magic with the new 
ground as uh, isn't there like it used to be back in our day. Again, of course, we had standing, we didn't have seats, so capacities could be a lot higher. Hence, Charlton Athletic, I think it was 76,000, wasn't it? And that yeah. wasn't for Charlton playing, I think that was watching the Who. Listen, uh, they used to get terrific gates. Yeah. 50, 60s and what have you as Charlton. Mm. But, you know, going back to, to about, well, maybe longer, I'm going to say about three months, two months ago, when you run about football, you know, it. the more I look at it now, the more they're trying to eradicate or get rid of the history side of it. Absolutely. Or the Premier League. And I've started to analyse it. Well, not analyse it. I had to look at that and thinking, watching what they're doing. And you are right. You are right because you, you brought it up first. And you're 100% right with all this. But again, what what they do... Getting, you know, I'm not really that, that bothered about it because it's not... Even... You used to, let, you used to like listening to people, you know, give their points of view yeah. in, in the game. But it's, even that's boring now, isn't it? You know? It's also sterile, isn't it? Because they have to say the right things. If yeah. they don't say the right things, they don't get the gig next time. Well, you have you to toe the well party I, line, don't rock the boat. You know as well as I do, mm. uh, the put before the media, before they do any any TV work, right? And they, they get told what to say. I told you. Yeah. I would do that to, for... Uh, they asked me to be more critical of Sheffield Wednesday, so mm. I'm not. Yeah, that, that, I won't, you know, I won't be told what they tell me I've got to do. No, I mean they they like to control you. They like to control people. They like to control their staff. They can only say certain things. I don't like that control. I've never been controlled. I've been tried to control, but I walked away like what you walked away from from football. I'd rather do this for nothing than have yeah. a big contract where I've got to watch what I say and say the right things because that ain't me, that ain't football. Football shouldn't be controlled. Football is a passion. And um, long may it continue that people have that passion and say what they see rather than be suppressed in their opinions and bow down and kowtow and take the knee because that's what certain people want you to do in the game. Uh, Emmy Martinez is safe. I'm not going to stick up for you, Gabby. What I, what, I, what I will say is this. You put on absolute, some fantastic shows. Well, we do. You, it's our show. But, well, no, you, but you put on also, you put on yeah. different people. You get different, you get really great names on, on, on you, you with great uh, players, mm. players, other people, you know, the great interviews. And you, and because you're not woke, or I'm not woke, we don't get the sponsors. No, absolutely. But eventually, eventually, mm. when all this wokeness is gone, they'll be begging. They'll be begging, Gabby. I guarantee you. You see, I mean, the thing is, I I make podcasts, generally speaking. Um, a brilliant, Gabby. I'm telling you, they are brilliant, what you do. But but the players that that I talk with, and, and you know, a number of them and, and my friends, are, you know, heroes of mine that I used to watch when I was a kid and, and are in their late 60s, early 70s, and some in their 80s. And what's happened with the advent of the Premier League these records that have been eroded and, and they don't talk about them on broadcasts. So the names like Terry Curran, like Alan Hudson, like Charlie George, like Rodney Marsh, like Frank Worthington, you don't you don't get talked about so the young kids don't know who you are. So, you know, when we do a podcast, it's like, well, who was that? Well, it's an absolute legend. There isn't a player today that's capable of lacing his boots. But Unless you're in the... Unless you're yeah. in the on the scene, TV, in, in yeah, the public yeah. eye, I, I, you're hundred uh, percent right on that. But uh, when you can do a job, like, like you, you enjoy, you enjoy doing what you do. Oh, I love it. I it's do. Always, it's always you'll always get a better picture and uh, a better performance when you enjoy something. It's like me being a footballer. Because I want to be a footballer. You know, you try even harder. Absolutely, um, we to be successful. And, you know, so you doing what you do, 
You're not, you're not doing it because, like you say, they're telling you what to do. You're not doing it for money because, you, you know, you get nothing from it. No, absolutely. I, I just phone up my mates and we have a chat about football. Uh, we've done a, a latest Hudson's View. Uh, it's called Cars and Cakes. <laughs> and it's an absolute classic because Alan did write up a piece about when he was driving uh, it, from Tampa Bay to Clearwater, and he writes some fantastic writings on his on his um, Facebook accounts. Does. Alan does, and I phoned him up. I said, "Al, we've got the written stuff. Let's have a chat about it." So, so we did. We done a, a thirty minute podcast, and I tell you something, he's absolutely hysterical. And we are going out tonight with Maverick Tales. And it's a tale of when Alan Hudson was in Stoke and a scenario with a car. And, and I'm I'm in tears to listening to him because he's just so funny telling the story. But Emmy Martinez save against Leeds United. The ball that went across to um, Luke Aileen. And it was a tremendous first time pass to the central striker who I looked at it. I'm watching it live. Tom's at the ground. I thought I was going to get the ticket because one of his mates doesn't usually go to the night games, but did go. So I was watching it in my uh, home in Bartley Green. I thought, that's it, 2-1. Uh, and what a, what a save. It was one of those that as soon as the ball went over, you're waiting for the net to ripple. But Martinez proved what a fabulous, world-class goalkeeper he is. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You're not kidding me. You, 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 Probably taken much notice him since the World Cup, and just before then, I, I should say, with Villa, he would pull some great saves off. Yeah, you know, the kid who scored the first goal against Leeds the other night, yeah, Bailey. I'm um, oh, Bailey, Leon Bailey, Bailey. yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I had I waited for uh, Villa to beat Wolves, all my teams are up in 93rd minute, he goes round the goalkeeper, yeah. And misses an open goal. Yeah. And then he goes and scores an absolutely young dinger against Leeds United. But it was on his left foot and the other one was on his right foot. And he his right foot really is only for standing on. A professional football, I hear that all the I time. Know, it's incredible. I find it absolutely amazing. I wanted to I wanted to be able to keep the both feet, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure after that Wolves game when he was crying, he wished that he'd done extra training and could kick with both feet because he would have uh, won the game for Aston Villa. But you're right. I mean, what a strike. He's coming off the right. And that's it with players that are just so one-sided. I mean, they, they do, it does make me laugh when they say, Messi is one-footed. Yeah, but Messi's different. What a left foot that is. He still can play with his right foot, guys. But that left foot is a wand. Um, By the way, he can play with his right foot. Of course he can. You know, it's just... Did that left foot, is that good? Yeah. You know, it's unreal. And this is the thing, when your left foot is a wand, why would you use your right foot? <laughs> because there's nothing that he can't do. As um, as Kenny Burns used to say about Liam Brady, he could open a tin of peas with that left foot. And uh, Lionel Messi certainly is in that category. But uh, So Bali Mumba, didn't know much about the kid. What a player he looks. Martinelli's back control and Emmy Martinez's save is my trilogy from the Magic Moments. The trilogy in Book Corner in association with my football books, uh, TC. One that Andy from my football books always gives us one. We're going to have that in third place this week. There is a, a reason for that. But firstly, I'd like to talk about the book that I've put in here. A smiling young boy, I would say probably 1971, maybe 72, this picture was taken. Uh, Charlie George, My Story, uh, with Alex Montgomery. Uh, Charlie George, what a player. Um, what, one, one of the greats, wasn't he, Charlie? Yeah. He played with oh. him. At, um, at you know, he, he, listen, near mine on a football field, and he was brilliant on a football field. Yeah, but he, you know, in training, yeah, when when you just not messing around, but when you you can train things in training. Mm. I mean, they came off in, in games, but you know, in, in training, you just watch him, you think, what a talent this kid's got. Mm. What a talent! I mean, how good was Charlie for oh. you know for for people? The best, ever, the best I played with. He's the best English centre forward I've seen. And you he, know, before you know, Jimmy Greaves, I would say, were the best. But yeah. after that, 
Charlie was the best I've seen. But Charlie was not just a, a goal scorer as your conventional striker like, you know, in modern days, Harry Kane, he scores all these goals. Charlie wasn't absolutely prolific, but he was just an absolutely prolific football player Charlie as well, Charlie, wasn't he, Charlie? Uh, Harry, Harry Kane scores goals. Yes, absolutely. Right? Charlie George scored goals. Yep. Med goals. Got yep. pace. Got strength. Yep. Brilliant in the air. Yeah. Timing was fantastic. Mm. Touch, absolutely sublime. Second to none. You know. And, and that's what's won, tr- won trophies. You know, every game, Tottenham, he yeah. keeps being their leading goal scorer. But what has Tottenham won? And I don't mean to be critical of him. Yeah. You know, uh, he hasn't got terrific pace, has he? But no, he's, not, he's not blistering. Goal scoring record. Yeah, not it's blistering. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, phenomenal. Now, you, do you want to play with your team what scores in 20, 30, 20, 25 goals, 30 goals a season and don't win nothing? Or do you want somebody in a team what can get 25 goals and win trophies? But you, you know, it's I mean... not right somewhere when, when, when you look at that, you know. Well, Cluffy, know. Cluffy now, didn't he, in the, uh, in the late 50s when he was talking about his um, teammates at both Sunderland and, and, and Middlesbrough? I can't defend, he said. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'll score less goals, you keep less out, and we might just win something. And and he's absolutely right. There's there's not much point in keep scoring goals and being leading goal scorer if you, you're winning nothing because... Your team around you just fundamentally isn't good enough. But Charlie, whatever team he played for, he had great players around him. But again, I go back to those were the golden age. That was the golden age of football. All football teams had so many great players. There were so many great teams so that great could win the so league in the teams. 70s. Absolutely. You know, so Charlie, when, you know, for instance, well, we'll go into Charlie a little bit later because he's in our Legends Lounge. But everything that you want to know about Charlie George from Charlie's uh, career coming through as a kid at Islington. Um, Alan played against him when uh, when they were both 15 and, and, you know, through to his career that sadly only amassed one England cap, which is absolutely unbelievable. They brought him off. They played him on left wing. It's incredible. It's incredible. Right. And... Uh, they played him on left wing. Yeah. And they brought him off after 68 minutes. Yeah. Never, ever played again. It's, but, but Alan always, it's a bugbear of Alan's. That when you look at Charlie got one England cap and he didn't play the full 90 minutes. And then you get other players that couldn't lace Charlie's boots, that have got 50 or 60 caps. And people look at players like that and overlook Charlie and say, oh, he was a one-cap I've, wonder. And I realise, I realise, I realise what, they don't want people like Charlie George. No, they don't. What, what's going what's gonna to question hmm? their authority what, when, when they're not winning things? Yeah. And it's you know, what, for what Don Revy won at Leeds, he was very poor. At um, England, I think he's one of the worst England managers of my my time. Now, when I say that, it's because Leeds United were no, not one of the worst, the most disappointing. I think yeah. I should rephrase it and say that. Well, you, you can say, you can say both of them really because they, they were poor, weren't they? Yeah, we were. We right. a, we actually but were. Poor. You, we wouldn't expect him to fail. No, for the team and the and how that team played at Leeds at Leeds United. Absolutely, but he, he and he got all the best players to pick did. from in the country. I know, but so you're not wrong. Mm. But in in argumentative terms with, with people, they will turn around and say. They will turn around. Some people will turn around and say, you know, um, how can you say that? But you you're not wrong on that, Gabby. You are not wrong on it. If I and would... he's not being critical to him because, no. as a club manager, <clears throat> we both agree. Oh, hundred percent. He's second to none. Brilliant. Phenomenal. He's, club, he's second to none. Yeah, phenomenal. What Don Reeve had done at Leeds United was phenomenal, but what he'd done at England was an absolute disgrace. And if I was the chairman of the FA, I would have sacked Don Reeve. No, when... I would have sacked Don Reeve. What I would have sacked, I'd have sacked all FA first and foremost. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, but when he had that, that session and he told Charlie, he told Alan, he told Good. Rodney, he told Frank, Frank. Tony Curry. Tony Curry. <laughs> and he, he's told Frank Stan Bowles. I don't want you. I don't he, want you. 
Unbelievable. How do, how does that, how I do don't you, know. How do you feel as a player? I don't. I don't know. How do you, how... I never had that many with managers. They didn't want no. me. But where you know, are you going would, as a nation? I would argue with someone with a um, yeah. The, the philosophy they played. What did you just say there? Because I was talking. Well, Sorry. How how do you go as a nation when you actually, you know, the idea of 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 English football is getting English football players that can play on the world stage that are world class, and then you have a a get together, a training session, an England selection. You know, I'm not sure if that was just a get together or it it, it was. You know, preparing for one of the uh, the international games that they had, but I mean that's completely irrelevant. But you're getting all these players, and you tell your most creative, talented players that have come through for generations that they're not wanted. You think, well, what's the point in playing football? I, I just don't understand. It's it's incredible. No wonder we won nothing. You know, it stinks. On it does, don't it? Yeah. And then people, you see, idiots say, well, in the 70s, England couldn't have been no good because we didn't even qualify for World Cups. No, because we didn't play our best players, for God's sake. Are you all stupid? By the way, by the way, we didn't, they didn't have easy games like they have. <clears throat> Absolutely. We had some well, difficult games. So they played tougher games. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And managers are play, still playing bad a lot of bad players, average players, not bad players, average players. Yeah, but I mean, that game in Italy, what was it, 1976, 77 maybe, when we needed to, to win um, in, in Italy. And Don Reeve took a team, he brought Stan Bowles back. But his midfield consisted, I think it was Trevor Brooking, Trevor Cherry and Brian Greenoff. You know, you're thinking, what the hell's going on? Alan Hudson and Tony Curry are staying at home watching that game and you just think it just beggars belief how naive stupid and um it's just utterly what did ridiculous Alan, what did i not something of trevor brooking never really asked him about trevor brooking i think trevor wasn't you know wasn't a bad player he was i a, thought he was a good a yeah. decent player my was a good yeah. player Steady. but fluffy i mean fluffy used to say look it floats like a butterfly and stings like a, what is it it stings like a bee. You know, no. Well, Miami Daly certainly done that. No, but no. Uh, that's what Cluffy said about him. It floats like a bu- butterfly or something it, it was. Right. And I, asked, I used to think he's a bit harsh, but Cluffy never really fancied him, Trevor Brookin. I always thought that Trevor Brookin was a really steady, eddy kind of decent, real good footballer, but England international, when you're looking at Curry and Hudson, for I me, think, couldn't lace their boots, but again, yeah, I think, all I think that one it, it floated like a butterfly, yeah, stings like one. That's what he used to say. Probably, I think that's what it was, probably. That's what it was, like. you know, just you know, but uh, no, but you know, when Chevy Cherry was a, a good player, but good left get, back, but more, not a midfield player. But listen, for him to get more caps than than Uddy yeah. and uh, Stan Bowles and them. Mm. Unbelievable, isn't it? But again, I think more caps in midfield. I'm on a but it's, right, it's again, a it's centre opinions, half. It? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. All no. all football is about opinions, and it is fact that we didn't qualify for World Cups, and it is my opinion that we didn't qualify because we didn't play our best players. And Charlie George, unbelievably, um, was overlooked and was one of those great players. Denied promotion by Tree, TC. The Book of Amazing Football Facts by Les Scott is the second book that I've got in our Book Corner trilogy. It's a book that we will be looking at facts and um, in our Strange But True, I've got the reason why a team was denied by a tree. So I I have bought this book and I'm going to be looking through it. And what I love about books like this is you can read them from the back page to the front rather than the front to the back and you can dip in and you can find fantastic facts. Because last week on the podcast, I did give out a fantastic fact from a book that I'd read that Colchester United were the first winners of the Watney Cup, and that was the first uh, sponsored uh, competition uh, in English football 
it was the first sponsored competition in English football, but Derby County did win it in 1970. So although we got this fact from a book, the book was incorrect. And Bristol Rovers and Stoke City were the other winners of the Watney Cup. And in uh, David Tossell's wonderful book, All Crazy Now, English Football and Footballers in the 70s, fantastic read and David in one of his chapters does talk about the Watney Cup and the Texaco Cup and I have done a podcast with David about this wonderful book and I do just want to mention Get It On How the 70s Rock Football by John Sperling as well so there are two additional books in Book Corner and the book that I listened, uh, I listened to um, yeah uh, 